Well, greetings, everyone, and Merry Christmas. Thank you for joining us on our very special Christmas Eve service. Now, this is one of those times of the year where you probably don't have to guess real hard about what I'm going to be preaching about. We are concluding our series called The Advent of Hope, and we've been looking at the Christmas story. Now, a lot of times people look at the Christmas story, and it seems like it starts with an angel visiting Mary and Mary becoming pregnant, or maybe even her relative Elizabeth being pregnant with John the Baptist. But I want to suggest to you that the Christmas story actually starts a lot further back than that. And today we're going to be looking at the Christmas story by looking in Matthew chapter 1 at the genealogy of Jesus. Now, a genealogy is simply um, a, a look into family lineage. And as we look at the family lineage, I think it's going to help us to better understand not only the Christmas story, but in a way I think it's going to help us to better understand 2020, this year that's coming to a close right now. Now, I have to admit, as a preacher, when 2020 first started, there were so many temptations to want to say, this is the year of vision. This is going to be the year where where God opens up our eyes, similar to how it might be in 2021 where everybody say, this is the year that God is going to take off our masks. But, you know, in, in, in 2020, as we think about it, 2020 was that time where our eyes are going to be open, vision is going to be greater, and um, what a great mark in the course of history. But 2020 actually happened. And instead of it being a year of vision, in some ways 2020 felt like a year of division. And and instead of it being the year where um, God allows our eyes to be opened, in many ways, 2020 felt like the year where there were doors that were closed. Even the most pessimistic amongst us probably could not have predicted what this year has looked like. But I have heard that it said that hindsight is 2020, which means that sometimes things look clearer looking through the rearview mirror than they do looking through the windshield. And and perhaps it may be, it may just be that it'll be years down the road before we fully understand what God was doing in this year. But just like we can look in the genealogies and see that God was up to something, perhaps as we look at the story of Christmas, it'll remind us as well to have confidence in the fact that God is up to something even now. So, Turn with me to Matthew chapter 1, and we're going to look at the very first verse in the New Testament. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, and then we're going to skip over to Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. It says, The record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Let's skip over to verse 17. It says, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. You know how I'm going to entitle this message today, Advent of Hope. As we bring this, um, this, this series, Advent of Hope, to a close, we're going to entitle this message, Hindsight 2020. Hindsight 2020. Let's pray here together. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to join together this Christmas Eve. I'm asking God that as we open your word that you would open up our hearts. And God, as we see your faithfulness throughout the course of the story of Christmas, God, I pray that you would open up our eyes a little bit more to see your faithfulness here in 2020. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, listen, I realize that when it comes to reading the Bible, genealogies are not always people's most exciting thing to read. So-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so begat so-and-so. And so as we read through the genealogies, it's not always the most interesting thing to read, but yet I want you to understand that every name tells a story. And, in a sense, um, all of these names collectively tell a story. I heard it said that Jesus really completes the story that the Old Testament tells. Now, I do have to say this on a personal level. As an African-American, I long to be able to trace my own lineage. 
You know, I, I really can't trace my family's history beyond slavery. And, and, and there's part of me that longs to be able to know my own lineage. But, but what I have found is that on this side of eternity, there's some gaps that I will never have answered. But here's the good thing, is that when I look at this lineage here of Jesus, in some ways, I don't just see the story of Jesus and the story of Christmas. I see the story of all of humanity in it as well. And so when we look in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, the very first verse gives us like this general overview. It lets us know that this is the the record of the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. And so it gives us this kind of overarching general statement. And then in verses 2 through 16, what we have is we have the detailed names of different people throughout the history of the family lineage of Jesus Christ. Now, to some of your disappointment, I'm not going to read through all of these different names, but I do encourage you to read through it on your own and even go through in the Old Testament to read some of the stories surrounding some of these names. But let's jump over to verse 17. Verse 17 kind of pulls it all together, and it says, So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And from the deportation to Babylon to the Messiah, 14 generations. Now, now you notice there that it says 14 generations, and numbers are significant in the Bible. In fact, there's an actual book of the Bible called Numbers. But you see that seven is the number of completion, and you see seven plus seven, 14 generations. And so there's a lot to unpack there. But what I really want us to pay attention to are the different names that are given here. You have Abraham, you have David, And then you have the deportation to Babylon, which is also known as the Babylonian exile. And then we have the Messiah. Now, to understand the Messiah, you have to look back with hindsight 2020 vision to understand what God was doing all throughout the course of history. And if we go back to to Abraham, we are first introduced to him as Abram in Genesis chapter 12. Now, let me just read here what it says in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 through 3, because Abraham is a significant part of the story of Christmas. Now, in Genesis chapter 12, he's visited by God, and it says, Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation And I will bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the ones who curse you, I will curse. Some of you are like, I want that promise. I'm signing up for that. And then at the end of verse 3, it says this. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. See, this is known as the Abrahamic covenant. That through Abraham, God is going to bless all of the families, all of the nations of the earth. And this is the promise that God gives him. And it was going to be through the family lineage of Abraham that God would eventually bring the Messiah. Well, there's no wonder why he's listed here in Matthew chapter 1. And Abraham and his wife Sarah, they later go on and they have a child whose name is Isaac. And then Isaac, whose name means laughter because they were so old when Isaac came. Uh, Isaac has a son named Jacob. Now, Jacob is later renamed Israel, and Israel has 12 sons, one of whom is Joseph, who goes to the land of Egypt. And while he's in Egypt, they are prospering, but eventually the people of Israel are become, they, they, they go into bondage to the Egyptians, and God sends a man named Moses, helps to rescue the people out of Egypt, which is what you find in the book of Exodus, and then God begins to build a people, a nation, out of the Israelites. Now this nation Israel was going to be a place, or be a nation, where God begins to reveal himself, not just for the Israelites, but for all the people of the world, all the nations, which is what he spoke back in Genesis chapter 12. And so this nation 
begins to, to grow and it, 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 it goes into the land that God promised for them. And then um, it is first governed by judges, but eventually it is governed by kings. And while there were a lot of kings, the greatest amongst them was a man named David. Now, David, this is the same David that we read about in 1 Samuel chapter 17 that takes on Goliath with a slingshot and five stones. By the way, he only really needed one to get the job done. But this was a man after God's own heart. And he was far from perfect, but he loved God. And God raised him up from being this shepherd boy to being the king over all of Israel. And then God, just like he did with Abraham, makes a promise, a covenant with David as well. And we can read that in 2 Samuel chapter 16, um, chapter 7, verse 16. 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16. And here's what the prophet Nathan said to David. He said, your house and your kingdom shall endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Man, what a, what a, uh, a powerful word. He is letting them know on your throne, David, there's going to be someone from your lineage that sits on it forever and ever. And when someone was sitting on the throne, having somebody on the throne meant stability. It meant peace. It meant rest. It meant prosperity to the people that are being governed. And so this is known as the Davidic covenant. God first gave the, Ab- the, the Abrahamic covenant, and now he's given the Davidic covenant. No wonder these two are mentioned first in the New Testament in the lineage of Jesus. But something happens because the deportation to Babylon is also mentioned in Matthew chapter 1, verse 17. Now, what happens is a couple of generations after David, the kingdom of Israel is split in two. And as this kingdom is split in two, then you had the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, and some kings were good, most were not. And so as a result, eventually the northern kingdom is, is captured by the Assyrian army, but then you had the southern kingdom. And, and eventually, because of repeated disobedience to God, they are captured and exiled and destroyed by the Babylonians that came. Now, if you think that 2020 has been a bad year, 586 B.C. would have been considered a really bad year to the, to the Jews because that was the year where the Babylonians came and not only ransacked their nation and their land and destroyed their, their, their people and also destroyed the temple, which was where God himself would meet with the people of Israel. He de- they, they destroyed all of that. And, and you could imagine how they would have felt in the midst of all of this. God, what about your promise to Abraham? God, what about your promise to David? How is somebody going to be sitting on your throne forever when you've allowed for, um, you've allowed for uh, the, the, the people to be destroyed and for the Babylonians to come and do that and bring us into exile? That's what the deportation was all about. But in the midst of all this destruction, in the midst of all of that pain, Jeremiah, who was a prophet, Probably with tears in his eyes, he was known as the weeping prophet. He, he said this in Lamentations chapter 3, verses 21 through 23. He says, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. How in the world could you have hope when everything around you seems to be bad? He says, this I recall to my mind, therefore I have hope. The Lord's love and kindness has never ceased. His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And so in the midst of all the tears, in the midst of looking like God's word that he spoke to Abraham and to David is no longer going to take place, he is reminded of the faithfulness of God. And sometimes when we're in the midst of difficult situations or a difficult moment in life, when we don't understand the why, we have to trust the who. And what he realized is who God was as faithful. And so... In the midst of this, God's people are now taken into captivity. They're taken into bondage. But then it tells us in Matthew 1.17, 14 generations later, the Messiah comes. And the Messiah is a reminder that God is still faithful. 
Now, obviously, looking back, it's easy to make sense of it. It says, well, of course, this is what God was doing with Abraham, with David, with the Babylonian um, deportation. But sometimes when you're living in it, it doesn't really make sense. But with the coming of the Messiah, the advent of Christ, that's what the word advent means. It simply means coming. With the coming of Christ, it reminds us of the fact that God is faithful. You know, right now, we are living in between two advents because the Christmas season causes us to look back on one sense on the fact that Jesus Christ came. That's what we celebrate. But it also causes us to look ahead of the fact that Jesus Christ is coming back again. Not as a baby, by the way. But he's coming back again, and yet now we live in the in-between time, and in this in-between time, we have years like 2020 where it feels like Things are difficult. So how do we have hope while we're waiting? Here's how we have hope while we're waiting. We remember in this Advent season of the faithfulness of God. And you know what Christmas story tells us? The Christmas story tells us that God is faithful to his promises, he is faithful to his people, and he is faithful to his plans. He's faithful to his promises. See, what God spoke to Abraham and to, to, to David, even when it looked like God had said, you know what, I'm scrapping this plan, on to the next thing, we realized that because the Messiah came, that God's promises were yet to be fulfilled. God is still going to make it happen. But you might say, well, hold up, Pastor. What about all of those who died while they were waiting for the promise to be fulfilled? You know, this year, there's been a lot of people who have died. But what about that? Well, I might not be able to answer all your questions, but I can say this. That same Messiah that was born is the same Messiah who lived. And that same Messiah who lived is the same Messiah who died. But that same Messiah who died is the same Messiah who was raised back up to life, Jesus Christ. And if he has the power to be raised back up to life, then I have the confidence to believe that he has the power to raise back up to life those who died while waiting for the fulfillment of his promises so that even death itself cannot stop God's promises from being fulfilled. God is faithful to his promises. But here's the second thing that we understand on this Christmas Eve is that God is faithful to his people. He has not given up on his people. He could have just said, you know what, you guys have messed up. You guys have sinned. And you know what, as a result of that, I'm done with you. I don't know if part of what we've experienced in 2020 has to do with some of the sin and some of the brokenness. Maybe it has to do with punishment. I'm not even going to try to argue or debate that right now. But what I know is that God was willing to come into his creation instead of giving up on his creation. And it lets me know that God is not finished with his people. So when I I look in the New Testament in Luke chapter 2, and we see the story of Simeon who was um, in the temple when Jesus as a baby was brought in, here's what he had to say in Luke chapter 2, starting in verses 28 through 32. He said, it says, then he took him, talking about Jesus, into his arms and blessed God and said, now Lord, You are releasing your bondservant to depart in peace, according to your word, for my eyes have seen your salvation. Hold up. How did he see the salvation of the Lord? They were at that time under the Roman Empire. It didn't look like there was salvation that was coming, but he recognized that in seeing this baby, he had seen the Lord's salvation. And going on in verse 31, it says, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles, and the glory of your people, Israel. See, Simeon understood something that some of us have yet to understand, that because Jesus has been born, it lets us know that God is faithful to his people. God is a faithful God. He's faithful to his promises. He's faithful to his people. But here's the thing, too. He is faithful to his plan. You remember what it said back in Genesis chapter 12? 
It said that Jesus, I mean, that God was speaking to Abram at that time and saying, through you, all the nations and families of the earth are going to be blessed. You know who that includes? It includes you. It includes me. God's hope, God's plan has been to rescue us and to take us who were once far off and rescue us and bring us into his family. You know, just the other day I was able to see an old movie that I hadn't seen in quite some time called Guardian. And I'm not talking about Guardians of the Galaxy. I'm talking about the one from the early 2000s with Kevin Costner and with Ashton Kutcher. It was about rescue swimmers. Now, rescue swimmers, their job is to go in the most difficult, chaotic water situations and go and rescue people. Not like a lifeguard, shout out to lifeguards, but not like a lifeguard kind of sitting at the edge of the pool, just kind of waiting to kind of, hey, somebody went into the deep end when they shouldn't have and they're trying to help them out. But these people would go into the most dangerous situations where ships that have gone down to sea and other things where it's not safe to go into, they would go in there. And sometimes people are in such a condition that they're not able to just be rescued by somebody sending them a floating device. Hey, here's a floaty, good luck. They're not able to be rescued simply by somebody sending them a rope, saying, hey, take this rope, I'll see you on the other side. Sometimes they're in such a condition that the only way that they can be saved is by somebody willing to put themselves in harm's way to go and rescue them out of their situation to bring them back to safety. And I want you to know this, is that we were in such a condition in humanity, in sin, not being in bondage only to the Babylonians, but being in bondage to the brokenness and to the sinfulness of this world that God didn't just send a prophet. Now, he did send prophets, but he didn't just send a prophet. And he didn't just send a, 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 a king. And as great as Abraham was and as great as David was, he needed to send something far greater. So he sent himself. And so Jesus Christ came on earth. And this is why the gospel is called the good news. is because God was willing to become man in Jesus Christ and put himself in harm's way, lived a life that we were supposed to live, and then he died the death that we were supposed to die in our place. Three days later, he rose again from the dead, proving that he truly is the Son of God, proving that he truly is faithful to his promises, proving that he truly is faithful to his people, and that he is faithful to his plan, and that he's now offering salvation and forgiveness of sins to those who would turn, repent from their sins, and turn towards him in faith. This is the good news of the gospel, that God was faithful enough to come towards us when we weren't able to swim towards him. And God is faithful to his plan. And so when we think about the Christmas story, it is a reminder that God is faithful. And because he is faithful, we can continue to be faithful even when it doesn't make sense. We can continue to serve God even when it feels like the world around us is falling apart. We can continue to worship God when it feels like there's things that we don't have around us to celebrate. We can still celebrate him and we can still open up our hearts to God even if we're in a situation economically where we don't have any gifts to open because God is faithful we have the confidence to continue living faithful as well and as I close I want to close with this you know the crazy thing just going back to the whole idea of rescue swimmers I was really intrigued about them and I started looking them up a little bit there are times when they would go to rescue somebody But because that person is in such a panicked situation, they would actually begin begin to fight the person that is there to rescue them. And so in order for someone to be rescued, they have to surrender before they are saved. You know, when Jesus Christ is coming for us, there is a point where he is saying, listen, are you willing to surrender so that you can be saved? Listen, in 2020, perhaps some of you have been fighting God. You've been fighting against what God has been trying to do. You've been fighting against what God has been trying to call you into. You've been running away. But why would you run from the one who came to save you? He is faithful enough to say, I'm going to wait and see if you're going to surrender. And I believe that as this year comes to a 
close, this is time for some of you under the sound of my voice to surrender your own pride. Surrender trying to do it on your own. Surrender trying to run away from God and say, God, I am in desperate need of your salvation. I look at the Christmas story and I'm reminded that, God, you are faithful. And what a time, Christmas Eve, for you to give your life to this Savior. Let me pray for you. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you, God, that we are reminded as we look at the genealogy of Jesus that even in the most difficult situations, you remained faithful. And God, I pray for those who are listening to this today. And they are looking at this this last year, or maybe it's not even been a year, but the last season of their lives, and and maybe things have not really made sense. But God, I know that Hindsight is 2020. God, it may not be years before we understand, but God, I pray that they would have the confidence to trust you and trust your faithfulness and that they would call to, your, to their minds your faithfulness, God. And as a result, God, they would continue to live faithfully for you. God, we thank you that you have given us more than enough reason to trust you. So on this Christmas Eve, God, we collectively say we trust you and that you are faithful. Hindsight is 2020, but God, you remain faithful no matter what the year. In Jesus' name, we thank you. Amen. God bless. Have a great Christmas.